Good morning, everyone. Welcome to St. John's. It's great to have you in church today. A week ago Sunday, we had to move our parish picnic into the parish hall because it was so hot. This morning, I almost had to go change again and put on a long sleeve shirt because it was 58 degrees when I got uh, ready to come to church. Somehow, between last week, it went from summer to what feels like fall, and what a glorious day it is, and I am glad that you're here today. In your parish announcement section of your bulletin, in the back of your bulletin, you're going to notice all kinds of things that are going on in the, the weeks ahead, but this Sunday we have a great bit going on. We are going to hear, uh, have a St. John's Minute after the peace from one of our, our wonderful ministries that we do in and out of this church. It's called CYP. You may have heard of that. It's a community youth program. It's an afternoon tutoring program, and it's wonderful, and I'm not going to steal their thunder by talking any more about it, but you're going to hear more about that today. Following this service, we're going to have acolyte training. So if you have kids, grandkids who are interested in learning how to participate in the worship life of this church, I invite them to stay, um, and we will meet with them immediately following the service here in the church. If you have kids that are a part of that program and are learning a new uh, skill set, new position within the accolading core, uh, we ask them to stay as well. This afternoon at 3 p.m., we're going to join with churches across America and commemorate uh, uh, an event. And it's 400 years of African Americans being a part of America. The reason that we're doing that here and now is because the first note ever to let us know that African slaves came to America happened in August of 1619. They were a part of a ship's manifest that landed in this commonwealth in Jamestown. And that happened um, this month, 400 years ago. And so we're going to commemorate that with other churches across the, the nation. And we're going to toll our bells and sing some songs and say some prayers. And we're going to do that at 3 p.m. out in the garden. It's been a little surprising to me, to be honest, that I have had certain friends push back on doing such a thing, which is weird. I mean, I, we, I never got pushed back for celebrating the 4th of July, for instance. It's history, right? Well, this is also history. You can't just like the good parts. But the other thing is it's actually a history that America is proving itself and has proved itself through a lot of trouble in able to be overcoming and in able to write a new story. And if you think about America without the ancestors of those people who came here, would you even want to live in that America? I want it. And so we own up to the bad parts. We celebrate the good parts. We learn from it all. And we commemorate it and we pray for it. And God in his time will redeem it. And the way that we do that as Christians is to commemorate it and look forward to what God has next. And God always has something redemptive, even out of stories like that, next. So I hope you join us this afternoon at 3 p.m. All kinds of other things, as I said, going on. Please do look at them, stuff for people of all ages, worthy of your attention and being a part of. I'm glad you're here today. Let's worship God.
Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be Jesus, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Grant, O merciful God, that your church, being gathered together in unity by your Holy Spirit, may show forth your power among all peoples, to the glory of your name. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to all nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am only a boy. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I point you over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to pull down, to destroy and to overthrow to build and to plant. The word of the Lord.
Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid his hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. The Gospel of the Lord. But I said, Lord, I am only a boy. I do not know how to speak. But the Lord said to me, do not say I'm only a boy. And then the Lord put out his hand and touched even my mouth. You may be seated. Always remember Andy first. Whenever I hear that scripture from Jeremiah, Andy Mock, my best friend in childhood, who my wife Shelley recently put a picture of the two of us on a piece of furniture in our room, so I see it every day. Andy Mock, who died tragically and suddenly, just weeks after I left Memphis to go to seminary. I think of Andy because Andy put that scripture lesson, opened it up in the oversized altar Bible in the Church of the Nazarene in Memphis that had one of those big Bibles in front of the pulpit. He opened it to that passage the day I was asked to preach my first sermon ever. Do not say, I am only a boy. I will put my words in your mouth. Andy and that scripture are about the only things I thankfully remember about my first sermon. Those two things, and I guess just how weird it was that I, Eric Long, found myself preaching a sermon. See, I never dreamed of myself being a priest any more than most of you probably right now 
dream of you being a priest. I'm going to seminary did not easily come out of my 21-year-old mouth. It, it made no sense given who I'd ever been, who I wanted to be. As a boy, when you asked me what I wanted to be when I grow up, priest did not come out of my mouth. For sure in college, there was no hint that I was going to seminary. There were some hints <laughs> that I was not. <laughs> so much so that a college friend in front of my own mother upon hearing that I was going to seminary, blew out a drink <laughs> and said, Eric Long's going to seminary? I know how he felt. If I had a drink, I would have blown it out too. Now, because it was all so weird and strange and different from my previous ideas of how my life should go, I worried that this call, this sense that God was steering my life in this new radically different direction. Maybe it was just going to be a passing thing. I was like Scrooge initially with his visions. I thought maybe it was something I ate, a, a spot of mustard or however he put it. I mean, obviously I wanted to get it right because it had major consequences for my life if I got it wrong. I know that I've said this a million times, and the reason I keep bringing it up a million times is because it means that much to me but about that time in my life, I had just accomplished my childhood dream and was selected to go to Air Force pilot training. It happened just weeks before I felt this call to go into ordained ministry. Now that, if you had asked me at any time in my life since I was, could talk, really, through college, what I wanted to do in my life, it would be instantaneous, like my dad, I wanted to be a pilot. It was my forever absolute dream, and I achieved it only to have God come along and mess it all up. And I'll be honest, I didn't want God to mess it all up. And so in my own mind, I absolutely positively somehow wanted to make sure that this call was real. <laughs> Yet how do you pull that off? Well, over time, it somehow crystallized, and I came to the place where I did somehow know as well as we can know anything on this side of heaven. And so I made that hard appointment with my air guard commander, and I went into his office and gave up what had been my dream for my life, my pilot slot. And four months later, moved from Memphis to a town I've never lived in, Kansas City, at just barely 21 years old, and brought this woman along with me. And with that, my friend blew out his drink. Now, I'd love to tell you that it was all happily ever after from then on, but that's not how real life stories go. At seminary, the only job I could find that worked well with my seminary schedule, what a lot of other seminarians were doing, and I did this as a brand new college graduate, mind you, was drive a school bus. Until this week, I didn't know those skills were still in need here in Roanoke, they need them. <laughs> and although they taught me how to drive a big school bus, they gave me a little one. And it was a little one filled with kids who had been kicked out of their schools because they had already had trouble with the law. I cannot tell you how many times I got the number one sign with a different finger because one of my kids threw something out of that bus at somebody's car. But the hardest part of it was I had to pre-flight, so to speak, this bus. See, I was a private pilot. I don't know if you know, noticed this, but pilots, even the ones at the airport with the big airplanes, they have to go out and pre-flight the airplane. You ever see them walking around? They're looking at the tires and the wings and all that stuff. You have to pre-flight an airplane. Well, guess what? They made me do that to that bus. And so at 5.30 in the morning, if weather so cold I didn't know that could exist in Kansas City, I had to go out and pre-flight a bus the entire time knowing that I could have been pre-flighting an airplane. And I'll be honest, 
it broke my heart a little bit. Moreover, at seminary, I quickly came to the realization that I didn't fit in any longer with the fundamentalist church of my childhood. Within about a semester of seminary, Shelley and I both could not imagine ourselves being pastor and wife, uh, you know, for a church of the Nazarene church. Now, this is the only church I'd ever known. And all this happened while I was sitting in Kansas City, a city we didn't know, in a church of the Nazarene seminary. And so the wheels of the bus, so to speak, were falling off. And, and Shelley and I wanted to leave. Often. Shelley's dad had just died. My parents' marriage was falling apart. And all that was going on. We wanted to leave. Even desperately, we wanted to leave. And, uh, but there we were, me at age 21, wondering if I had made the biggest mistake of my life and forfeited my dream over a call that maybe I called out wrong, and yet something somehow held me there. I can't explain it any more than I could explain that call, but it also was real. I knew somehow I was supposed to stay. For one thing, I really loved my studies, and I was good at them. So much so that even though I couldn't imagine being a pastor, I thought, well, I'll go and get a PhD and teach this stuff, which is a bad idea to teach something that you couldn't imagine doing. <laughs> I was young. But I felt God was somehow still in it, and so I stayed, and through a long course of events, well, here I am 27 years later. But none of that path to here was ever clear, not, not one bit of it. To this day, none of it makes any sense in any normal arithmetic of life that I can discern. I could never see it straight on, you know? I mean, it's only kind of in looking back, it's in retrospect, that I can see more fully God's plan working through it all to bring me to this pulpit today. And you know, I've come to see that that's because I believe our eyes are just not good enough. They're, just not, they're, they're not good enough to completely see God's plans in any immediate context of our own histories. And thus God is calling each and every one of us to look at the world about us through a new set of eyes, so to speak. Or maybe a different way to, to say it is God wants to, to put before our eyes, a different set of lenses, because, believe you me, we all have some lenses that we look through. These lenses that shape the world about us, that tell us who we are, who we most certainly are not. Lenses that, that, that shape the world and how it must work and how the world couldn't possibly go. Certainly, lenses of possibility for our lives. I mean, think about it. You, you know this is true. How is it that a child born here in Roanoke sees the world so radically different from a child born in North Korea? Or Iran? Or even Alabama? How is that the case? Because we look at the world through certain lenses, and, and thus we see what they allow us to see, and we say, this is the only way the world could ever look could ever be seen, could ever possibly go. And it doesn't even take something as tragic and extreme as a 9-11 to demonstrate just how dangerous it is to not realize that maybe there's a different way to see the world. That maybe your extreme way of seeing the world isn't the only way the world could be seen. But amongst the biggest and everyday dangers that exist for most of us is that these limits kind of shear the possibilities that we allow for our lives. They, they determine our horizons of possibility. See, I think that that's the point of the Scripture lessons that we just heard. That we tend to look at the world with eyesight that's way too limited. Whether it's Jeremiah who could only see his youth as this ultimate barrier. 
or maybe it's the religious leader in that synagogue that Jesus encounters, who could only see a God who's about the rules, so much about the rules that he could care less about the humanity of a woman. By the way, religion pulls this off all the time with these lenses. How is that so the lenses of their lives wouldn't allow them to see? And so it can be with us. We can be so restricted by our time and place and culture and prejudices and opinions, limited by what we believe possible. And yet what I want to offer before you today as an imperfect example is that God's world is full of possibilities that each and every one of us before would see as impossible. It's the storyline of our faith. From the beginning, Abraham, go to that land that you do not see, but I've prepared for you. Moses, go down and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. David, even though you're the youngest, you are going to be the greatest king of Israel. Sarah, even though you're barren, you're going to be the mother of nations. Peter, even though you're Peter, you're still going to get to be the rock upon which I'm going to build this church. And so it continues as we heard today, Jeremiah, yeah, you're only a kid, but you're going to speak for me. Woman, even though you've been crippled for years and live in a place where people don't think you matter, you matter to me, and I choose to heal you. Religious leader, even though you think God is bound by your ideas and rules about God, surprise, I'm God, not you. Eric, even though people will blow out their drinks, Upon hearing the news, you will be a priest in my church. We look at all of that and believe none of it's possible. And it's not. Looking through our lenses. Except God's horizons of possibilities are not bound by the limited vision of the likes of us. Now, I know that you have all kinds of excuses why that works with Abraham and Sarah and David and even Eric, but don't think it applies to you. I'm not good enough, probably somebody would say, uh, and by the way, you're not. Me either. That's why we get Jesus. You don't know what I've done. I don't need to know what you've done. I know what I've done, and I know that God's done something with me, even though he knows what I've done. I'm too used up for God to do anything with me. Abraham said that and ended up with a baby at age 80, which sounds awful to me. (laughs) And yet Abraham wanted it, and God gave it to him. The only requirement for new horizons in your life is perhaps a new openness to what might be God's horizons for your life. Because your life is full of wonders. How could it not be was crafted by a God of wonders? When I was 31, I noticed that my eyes were getting really bad. I always had really good eyesight, had to, to be a pilot. And so for the first time in my life, I went to an eye doctor and I was diagnosed with an eye condition I'd never heard of before. It's called keratoconus. It's this pimpling of the cornea. Some people who get it, hopefully not me, but some people who get it eventually need a corneal transplant. In the meantime, I just have not great eyesight. Now, when I got this news, I was still flying, just privately. And 
when I went in to do my flight physical, I barely passed a third class aviation physical with my contacts in because of my eyes. And that's when it struck me that I couldn't fly anymore any of those airplanes that I dreamed all my life of flying. Which, if you're doing the math, means that at age 31, if I hadn't listened to God at age 21, I would have been tossed out of the only career I was trained to do. Maybe God could see something I couldn't see. Last week, the, writers, the writer to the Hebrews said, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. By faith, we understand that worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things not seen. What is now seen was made from things not seen, and all of it from the word of God. And that same word can come to you, into your life, and offer your life surprises that you couldn't imagine could ever be formed. I can can attest to that, Because I live a life that is as big a surprise to me as the guy who blew out his drink. Thankfully, God didn't have the same limited vision as him. Or me. Thankfully, God's gaze is eternal. Even though mine's barely 2040 with contacts. Amen. Let us confirm our faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally God of the Father, God of God, light of light, true God, true God, God of In peace, we pray to you, Lord God, for all people in their daily work and life. For our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who are justice, freedom, and peace. 
for the just and proper use of your creation. For the victims of hunger, fear, and justice For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For those who visit the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For all who claim the gospel and all who seek the truth. For all bishops and other ministers. For all who serve God as their church. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation especially for those named on our parish prayer list. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. We pray for all who have died, especially for those whom we remember on the anniversary of their deaths, as named on our parish prayer list. For those who have died this week in service to their country, and for those who have perished in war-torn areas of the world, that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will, and those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask. Grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you in our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are the true sorrow and become the humble For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may be like the light of your will and walk in the way of Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. Please stand. The peace of the Lord be always with you. As the kids come in, let me welcome everyone here again. On Tuesday this week, as happens on many Tuesdays when school starts, I had the wonderful opportunity to not be able to find a parking place at this church. That happens on Tuesdays because our Head Start program, the oldest, by the way, in all of Roanoke that we house out of this church, started back up. The other thing that we do is TRUE, Temporary Relief for Unexpected Emergencies, where we help through money we raise and volunteers meeting with people in need to help people with utility needs and all the rest to keep them in their homes. On Wednesday, I edited the record that's about to go out. I hope that you will enjoy it. It it has an article in there about Camoyo, our ministry to Ghana. On Thursday afternoon, we had a ribbon-cutting ceremony to open up 
CYP's new space, which we're about to hear about. I guess I took Friday off, even though I was here. Yesterday, I was with David Todd and other members that work with our Haiti uh, projects, and they are putting together a trip to Haiti in January to go rebuild at least a portion of the church that was blown down by a hurricane. And I get to be the priest seeing all of this, and you are the people who make it all happen. One of the great ministries of our church is CYP. Jackie Smith is the executive director of CYP. She met you as you were coming in the door. Cheryl McNally is the new president of that board, and she is going to talk to us about CYP, how we can be a part, what it is, and welcome. Good morning. I'm the incoming board president for the Community Youth Program, or CYP, and a longtime member of St. John's. For many of us, St. John's has always served as a place of personal change. St. John's also gives the gift of opportunity and change to students living in Roanoke City. CYP, a ministry of St. John's, gives financially disadvantaged elementary and middle school students a safe environment for year-round after-school tutoring, educational experiences, field trips, and daily meals. We have kept the enrollment serving 35 students intentionally small to develop strong one-on-one -on -one relationships with each child. CYP was created over 20 years ago when a group of seven St. John's parishioners identified there was a lack of after-school programming in the Roanoke Valley for middle school students. With hard work and dedication by members of St. John's, CYP was born. Over time, the program has grown and strengthened and now has over 25 community partners. We are proud to share this past year with the gracious support of many St. John's parishioners and the Memorials Committee, CYP renovated its third floor space to better serve the educational needs of our students. Although we are incredibly thankful for past contributions, CYP still needs help to meet programming needs for the upcoming year. There are many ways to lend a hand to CYP. We are always in need of volunteers to tutor, monitor, and transport students home. Financial assistance is invaluable for programming. A gift of $10 can purchase a basketball. $25 buys supplies to teach students how to make a healthy snack. $50 orders materials for a STEM experiment. $100 pays for a field trip to the science museum or the pool. $400 sponsors a child for one month. And $3,800 sponsors a child for a year. We would love your support at one of our fun events during the year, oyster roast, dinner en blanc, holiday relief casseroles, and girls and boys nights out. We hope you'll be in attendance next Sunday, September 8th, following the 10 a.m. service when Eric and David bless CYP's newly renovated space. Michael, a fourth grade student, states it best. My opinion is that this is the best after school ever. I think you would, should have over a thousand likes on Facebook. I hope you will join CYP in making a difference in the lives of these precious children. Together, we're changing lives. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. This church is great because our heart is right. And through us, worlds that were formerly not seen, but that God saw, have come into being. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you and your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, and the sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Thank mm-hmm. you. 
These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord, to him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.
peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.